What was it about the Brontosaurus? What was it about that name that conjured such a deep fire of curiosity in the hearts and minds of children and adults alike? For Brian Sweetek, as he points out in his book, My Beloved Brontosaurus, it was because the shuffling, swamp-dwelling hulk was an icon of everything the dinosaurs were supposed to be. Big, scaly, and most of all, so thoroughly bizarre that they could have only belonged to a primeval past. But by now, you've probably been told that Brontosaurus, the great thunder lizard, wasn't a real animal. Not that the bones once called Brontosaurus didn't belong to a once living creature, but that the dinosaur's correct name is the bland and unfamiliar Apatosaurus. The Brontosaurus story is part of a century-old web of tangled scientific rivalries and misinterpretation. Mistaken identity, stubborn preconceptions, and the public's staggering devotion to the name are all what gave the Brontosaurus its legendary status. To do this story justice, we have to go back to the wild American West, where the world's first great dinosaur hunters began their tireless quest to find the biggest, most menacing, and impressive beast of ages past. Two men, Othniel Marsh from Yale University and Edward Cope, based out of New Jersey, spent the better part of their careers in one of the longest lasting and most fearsome scientific rivalries in history. After some disagreements surrounding the ownership of fossil bones from a quarry in New Jersey, the two set out to do everything they could to further their own careers while stepping out of their way to sabotage each other's. In their frenzy to discover and name as many extinct animals as they could, each of them revealed scores of undiscovered species, including rhino-like creatures with tusks, horses with toes, and menacing sea-going reptiles. But nothing could prepare either of them for what would come next. In 1877, while searching for fossils in the hills of Colorado, a commercial collector hit pay dirt, a treasure trove of huge fossil bones. By this time, just about all that was known of the extinct animals then known as the Dinosaurians were a few fragmentary skeletons from Western Europe and the East Coast of the United States. The rocks these new colossal bones were eroding from belonged to a time in Earth's history known as the Jurassic Period. Though nobody was quite sure just how old this age was, it was certain that the history of life still held many surprises. Othniel Marsh hired teams to unearth even more bones, and soon after, Cope caught wind of Marsh's discoveries and soon opened digs of his own in the surrounding area. The results were extraordinary. Within months, the two were already discovering and naming new dinosaurs. Dozens of skeletons belonging to several new species were unearthed, broadening the once narrow view of the lost world of the dinosaurs. For the first time, the scientific world was truly awed by the staggering strangeness of the dinosaurs. A new yet extinct world had been eroding out of the American frontier unnoticed for millions of years. One of the first dinosaurs Marsh named was one of astonishing size. Because he only had a partial skeleton of an immature individual, its full size was unknown, but what he did have was nothing short of impressive. It was among one of the first species of sauropod dinosaur ever discovered, the group of long-necked plant eaters. He went on to name the animal Apatosaurus ajax. Soon afterwards, Marsh heard news of similarly large Jurassic bones from a place in Wyoming called Como Bluff, so he dispatched men to work there as well. Like clockwork, Cope followed suit, sending in crews of his own. Then, just as before, there was no shortage of enormous skeletons. Among Marsh's finds was another skeleton of a once great Jurassic Titan. In 1879, he gave it the name Brontosaurus excelsus, the Great Thunder Lizard. This new skeleton stretched a remarkable 72 feet head to tail. Now, the true size of these animals could be fully appreciated. This specimen was remarkably well preserved, with nearly every important bone in the animal's great body accounted for, minus the skull. Headless sauropods seemed to be an all too common misfortune for paleontologists. The skull bones of long necked sauropods are remarkably thin, and they break apart easily not to mention the minute size of the head in comparison to the dinosaur's massive bulk, making headhunting even trickier. Marsh and other experts of his time didn't mount their prized skeletons for the public to see. They only brought them to life on paper, and in 1891, Marsh commissioned a reconstruction of Brontosaurus to be drawn, which revealed the true magnificence of the colossal reptile. Shortly after the deaths of Marsh and Edward Cope, a fossil hunter from the Field Museum in Chicago named Elmer Riggs made a new discovery after extensively studying the remains of both Apatosaurus ajax and Brontosaurus excelsus. 
When described scientifically, a new species is assigned two names, a first and a last. The first name is called a genus. In the case of Brontosaurus excelsus, the genus name is Brontosaurus, and the last name, excelsus, is the specific species. More often than not, a genus contains several different species. For instance, the human genus is Homo, but there are several species within it like Homo sapiens, Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo floresiensis, and so on. In 1903, Elmer Riggs decided that there were enough differences between Marsh's two long-necked dinosaurs to be called separate species, but that they were still similar enough to belong to the same genus. And since Apatosaurus was named two years earlier, Brontosaurus was reclassified as just another species of Apatosaurus. The name Brontosaurus was officially discarded, and its status as a valid genus name was revoked. And that should have been the end of it. In 1905, the American Museum of Natural History assembled an Apatosaurus skeleton for display, which also happened to be the world's first sauropod specimen ever mounted. But it wasn't labeled Apatosaurus as it should have been. For an unknown reason, well aware of Riggs's discovery just two years earlier, the museum's director, Henry Fairfield Osborne, purposely labeled the skeleton Brontosaurus. It was this decision that let Brontosaurus live on for decades. A skull for this animal still had yet to be found, but in the years to come, one after the other, museums across America began to mount their own specimens, each with a unique take on the head. Like the so-called Brontosaurus in New York, the Apatosaurus at Yale had a completely sculpted skull, but to a much different effect. The skull of a Camarasaurus, another all-American Jurassic dinosaur, was placed on the neck of the Carnegie Museum's Apatosaurus. Due to budget cuts, the Field Museum in Chicago couldn't afford expeditions to collect more complete skeletons, so they left their Apatosaurus with the front half missing altogether. Mixed and matched, incomplete, and headless skeletons of Brontosaurus graced the halls of American museums for decades, where the dinosaur became a cultural idol, embedding itself into the hearts and minds of the world. Perhaps because it was an enormous beast, yet so elegant a design, a dull-witted creature, yet so gentle a spirit, an ancient and mysterious monster, yet so new and familiar an animal. It wasn't until the 1970s before somebody finally took notice of the head problem. Jack McIntosh, a physicist turned paleontologist, grew increasingly skeptical with the Camarasaurus skull hanging on the end of the Carnegie Museum's Apatosaurus. He began to realize that Apatosaurus is much more similar to Diplodocus, a more slender and lightly built Jurassic sauropod, than either of them are to the Camarasaurus. He thought that he may find a clue in the field notes of Elmer Riggs from his expeditions to the Jurassic Rocks of Utah in 1909. Elmer Riggs writes of his spectacular discoveries at what would one day become Dinosaur National Monument. He also tells of the discovery of several sauropod skulls, most of which seemed to belong to Diplodocus. One of the skulls seemed a bit more wide and flat than the others, so Riggs speculated that this skull may be the infamous head of Apatosaurus. However, his colleagues didn't take him seriously, because they all felt sure that the blunt-snouted sculptures and snub-nosed Camarasaur skulls are what a brontosaur head should look like. Jack McIntosh took to rediscovering Riggs' lost sauropod skull in the collections of the Carnegie Museum, where in 1978, he found it. All this time while Apatosaur skeletons were suffering their own unique identity crisis, the real skull had been here all along. Soon after, Jack McIntosh finally reunited Apatosaurus with the correct head. Other museums followed suit by replacing their heads with replicas of the Carnegie specimen. The story of Brontosaurus was one of the greatest in all of paleontology, where bone hunters set out to discover the unknown and came back with the remains of some of the most strange and beautiful animals that ever graced our planet, ones that we will never have the opportunity to see. And that was the end of it. Brontosaurus was just an artifact of scientific history, just as the dinosaurs are to the Earth's history. Or so we thought, when in April 2015, Three paleontologists released a study where they analyzed the evolutionary relationships of the Diplodocids, the group of long-necked Jurassic dinosaurs that includes Diplodocus, Barosaurus, and Apatosaurus. But when studying the remains of all known Apatosaur species, they noticed that a few of them stood out from the rest to form their own group, which just so happens to include the genus once called Brontosaurus. It seems that due to unique differences in size, the anatomy of the neck, pelvis, and other physical features are enough to designate Brontosaurus as a valid genus name once again. For the first time in more than 110 years, Brontosaurus now stands apart from Apatosaurus. Since the days of Marsh and Cope, we have learned a staggering amount about life in the Jurassic. Brontosaurus lived in the golden age of sauropods, where perhaps dozens of long-necked plant-eater species shared the floodplains of western North America. Their world was one filled with a beautiful assemblage of unique animals, some well protected, some not. 
some enormous, some minuscule, where they often lived short, brutal lives in a land prowled by flesh eaters, some adorned with spectacular spikes and horns, some sleek and smooth, some fast, some slow, some killers, some opportunists. Together they lived and died on America's primeval stage for millions of years. While the story of Brontosaurus, the great thunder lizard, serves as a monument to the endlessly changing nature of science, it and its fellow Jurassic reptiles also stand in museums everywhere as ambassadors to an ancient time, a unique window to their vanished world. <laughs>